Lord and tell it to Jesus, tell it to Jesus, are you grieving over joys departed? Tell it to Jesus alone, tell it to Jesus, tell it to Jesus, he is a friend that's well known. You've no mother, such a friend. this evening and let's turn to Exodus chapter number 14. Exodus chapter number 14. As I'm getting set up and you're finding Exodus 14, what I'm going to do tonight is just continue on uh, with what we did from uh, a few weeks back, earlier in the month of June, where we've been trying to follow some of the BBS lessons. So the first week we talked about Moses and the burning bush and then we talked about Moses and, and the plagues, and so tonight we're going to talk about Moses and the Red Sea, and that's the, the third lesson, and it's called Through the Deep, God's Mighty Glory, and, and the lesson on that, that, like I said, that third evening is just based off the story of Moses and the children of Israel crossing through the, the Red Sea. So let's jump in. We're at Exodus chapter number 14. I'm going to begin down in verse number 29, Exodus chapter 14. We're in verse number 29. But the children of Israel walked upon dry land in the midst of the sea, and the waters were a wall unto them on their right hand and on their left. Thus the Lord saved Israel that day out of the hand of the Egyptians, and Israel saw the Egyptians dead upon the seashore. And Israel saw that great work which the Lord did upon the Egyptians, and the people feared the Lord, and believe the Lord and His servant Moses. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Lord, we thank You again for the opportunity to be here. We thank You for the opportunity to open Your Word and glean from it tonight. God, I pray that You bless Your Word tonight. And uh, Lord, just help me as I speak this evening. Give You glory and honor and praise for all things. Pray in Jesus' name. And amen. So tonight, what I'm going to try to do here is kind of like, you know the TV shows where they, they give you the ending and then they go back after the first little commercial thingy and then they work you up to how they got to the ending? So that's what we're going to try to do tonight. And so there's the ending. They make it through the Red Sea. We know that. So let's tell the story of how they, they make it through. So let's go back now to Exodus chapter number 12 where we left off a few weeks ago. We left off in Exodus chapter 12 in verse 29 through 36 when the, the last plague was was, was uh, occurred, and the, it was the plague of the death of the firstborn. And so it tells us in verse number 39 here, in Exodus 12, verse 39, it tells us that they were thrust out. Uh, the children of, 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 of Israel were thrust out of Egypt. So let's start down in verse 37, and let's read verse 37 to 38. And Todd, while I'm reading that, would you care to go ahead and shoot that PowerPoint up, brother? Uh, and it, so in uh, Exodus 12:37, and the children of Israel journeyed from Ramesses to Succoth, about 600,000 on foot that were men besides children, and a mixed multitude went up also with them, and flocks and herds, even very much cattle. Now, uh, I want to point out something here about this group that's leaving Israel. You know, in my mind, I think of like Charlton Heston's movie where there's just like a few people walking through water like this big, right? You know, and there's like the fake wind sounds and all that. You know, in my mind, I guess that that's what I picture. 
But the Bible tells us here that it was 600,000 men, right? And if you go back, if you, uh, in your Bible, in Numbers chapter 1, verse 45, is it picks up the narrative after, after Exodus. It's after the Red Sea crossing when they're, uh, and, and they, they do a census. In, in Numbers 145, it says, So were all those that were numbered of the children of Israel by the house of their fathers from 20 years old and upward, all that were able to go forth to war in Israel. So we're talking grown men. Even all they that were numbered were 600,000, 3,550. So not only that, but when we come back here to Exodus 12, verse 38, it tells us that they took their livestock with them too. So, I mean, to me, this is kind of opening tonight that this is a big group. You know, when you think 600,000 men, you know, a lot of like Bible commentators all seem to think that it was somewhere between 2 million and 3 million people. So you're talking a crowd of 2 million people and all their livestock that go with them. So now I kind of get why Pharaoh went after them after a little bit of time because he realized he just destroyed his economy when he let them go, right? Two million people that are slaves for you and you turn them loose. You know, and it was thought that the Egyptians only had three to four million people total in their society at that time. So you're talking like you went from six million people in your country to four million and the two million were the free labor. So I get why Pharaoh went after them. So um, there's a map behind us here and if you can't see it and you want to move. I mean, we're not high fluting. It don't matter. You can. Uh, I try to do a map for tonight, but you can see here's Egypt. Here's the Mediterranean Sea. Here is where Israel will eventually be. Uh, here's the Red Sea here. And then also these two little uh, offshoots of it here. This is the Sea of Aqaba, and this is what we're going to talk about tonight. This is where they actually crossed the Red Sea. Uh, and, and on this side here, this is Saudi Arabia here. You can see. Here's Egypt. You can see the Nile River uh, as, it, as it flows, uh, even from these satellites. And I just pulled this off of Google Earth. That's all this is. It's just a screenshot. And so uh, when you zoom in, you can kind of, there's the Nile Delta. You can see it's very lush, you know. I mean, uh, so you get why the, why the Nile was so important to them. It's like nothing but dirt and sand, and then there's green stuff on the Nile. So uh, this kind of puts it, kind of get the idea where we're at, okay? So... Uh, in verse 37, it tells us here that they they journeyed from Ramesses. And so uh, Ramesses, you can see, is up here in the northern part up here in the, the Nile Delta here that we just saw. It was all green and lush. Ramesses was at the north part of that, almost on the Mediterranean. And it tells us that they venture, venture over to Succoth. Here's Succoth, okay? Um, and so the modern... Today, what a lot of people think that the modern city today, this Tel El Daba, and I don't speak uh, Arabic, so bear with me. I speak hillbilly Virginian. But, uh, but the Tel El Daba is where uh, Goshen and Ramesses would have been at that time. That's the modern day city. And when you zoom in on it, look what, look, this is like, this is like Google, who is godless Google. Look, I mean, it says zone de Goshen. So even today, it's, they recognize that Goshen was there. And there's all these Hebrew, I mean, all these, I mean, excuse me, there's, there's these Arabic temple, you know, Arab temple things, Muslim temples. That, so even to them, it's, you know, they, they, I mean, we, this, this happened, right? We, we know God's word is real, but even Google has to kind of admit some of it, right? You know, they try to hide it in society. So uh, we can see here that, that it really is a, a, a real true place that still exists today. We know that. We're God's people here in church, but it is nice to be reminded of it. So uh, we can go uh, back to Genesis 47. I don't need you to turn there, but Genesis 47 verse 11 confirms that Goshen and Ramesses were essentially one and the same. Uh, verse 11, G he, uh, Genesis 47 11 says, And Joseph placed his father and his brethren and gave them a possession in the land of Egypt and the best of the land in the land of Ramesses, as the Pharaoh had commanded. And then in verse 27 of that same chapter, And Israel dwelt in the land of Egypt in the country of Goshen, and they had possessions therein and grew and multiplied exceedingly. So the Bible tells us that, you know, that uh, Ramesses and Goshen was one and the same. It was the same area. And that's where they ventured out of when they were thrust out that night. So uh, let's pick back up here. We're uh, still in Exodus chapter 13, or, or let's go over to Exodus 13. Let's look at verse number 20. Exodus chapter 13, and let's go to verse 20. And so it says, And they took their journey from Succoth and encamped in Ethan in the edge of the wilderness. 
Now, and let me give you a heads up what I'm doing here. Uh, I hope it makes sense. It makes sense in my mind. Uh, but I'm going to try to chase their, from the scriptures, I'm going to try to chase the path that they took. And then we're going to go back and make application of the scriptures with it. That's what I'm trying to do really quick. Okay, so if I'm talking like a spaz, I'm sorry. But I just want to make sure I get through everything because fuck it, God, why? So uh, it says here that they, they journeyed from Succoth and encamped in Ethan. I couldn't really find a definitive answer. And Dave and I were talking about this before church started. Some of this stuff researching, it's not real definitive on where things were. And some things will say it's here, and then other things say it's here. And when you compare it with the scriptures, it's like, it's not there, it's over here. And so some of this tonight, uh, you know, Ethan, I don't know where, where it was. So, but we know that it was probably, if Succoth is here, uh, and they're going over here, it was somewhere, it says, on the edge of the wilderness. And you can see from uh, these uh, maps here, here's a better one. Well, this one. You can see how, from, uh, maybe from up here, you can see how wilderness this is, how much of a mountain it is. So the edge of it would have been somewhere here uh, is where they would have been. Uh, notice that it said in verse 21 that the Lord, capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D, went before them. And you remember uh, when we spoke back with Moses in the burning bush, uh, we said that, that capital L, capital R, capital D means Jehovah, which is the self-existent one who reveals himself for the, the great I Am. You know, remember that the first mention of the name Jehovah in the Bible was in Genesis chapter number 2 when God created man. That's when the name Jehovah, uh, capital O, capital L O R D, appears in your Bible. You know, when man sinned, it was the Lord God or Jehovah Elohim that went to him in Genesis three nine. It, it was the the Lord God or Jehovah Elohim that covered them with the coats of skin in Genesis three twenty one. That that same Lord, capital L O R D, is the one that's leading his people here through the wilderness, and we see that he's leading them by a pillar of fire. Uh, by day, and he's leading them down by, uh, I'm, my iPad went bonkers, that you see that he's leading them by, uh, by a pillar of a cloud during the day, and he, he, you know, we think that he was shading them, maybe, is what, you know, Kyle and I were driving, we went to Home Depot this morning, and Kyle and I got talking about it, and Kyle was like, well, how would, how would they know if that from any other cloud in the sky? But the Bible calls it a pillar or a column, and I think of a column as that, you know, that it was something obvious, a pillar moving in front of them. You know, and there's some commentaries that I read that, that, that suggest that they, they think that God probably shaded them with that uh, and, and made them comfortable so they could walk all day in the sun in the wilderness. And at nighttime, they provided that, you know, God provided that light for them to move at night. And it tells us in several places, we'll see it here, that they traveled at night, probably because it's cooler and you're in the desert. And so they journeyed day and night, and God led them uh, with that. He provided the light at night and provided that coolness for the day. And then they camped on the edge of the wilderness in verse 20. But in verse 21, it implies that they continued on into the wilderness because in verse 21, it tells us that they go by day and by night. Now, look back at verse 18 for a second. I'm still in chapter 13. In verse 18, it says, But God led the people about through the way of the wilderness of the Red Sea. Now, the way of the wilderness of the Red Sea is what we call the modern-day Sinai Peninsula. That, would, that is the, the peninsula, uh, or the Sinai Peninsula I means the wilderness of the Red Sea that the Bible is speaking of. Because if we remember from these maps back here, you can see, oops, I went too far. Oops, here, no, here it is. Uh, you can see how the Red Sea comes up, and then these two, uh, the Gulf of Aqaba, and I can't remember this one. Anybody good at geography? Uh, this is the, uh, the wilderness of the Red Sea the Bible's speaking of here. Okay. If you feel like you're back in high school or middle school geography, I apologize. I didn't mean for this to be boring, I thought it was really fascinating. <laughs> uh, so we see that they're passing through the wilderness of the Red Sea. Now, uh, you may have heard of Ron Wyatt. He was, a, he was a Christian archaeologist that lived in the 70s, 80s, 90s. Anybody heard of his name? Uh, I read some stuff about him and some of the stuff, and I was talking with uh, Scott, the, past, the assistant pastor up at Grace Baptist earlier in the week, and he had mentioned this. Uh, and so I was doing some research with his, and his stuff is fascinating. He did a lot of research here, and uh, he believes that, oops, here it is, that this little town here 
You can see it on the map right here, this little big sandy thing sticking out into the Gulf of Aqaba here. When you zoom in on it, it's called Nueva. It's Nueva, uh, Egypt. Nueva means waters of Moses opening. That's what it means. Which is, you know, it's like, what? Uh, so listen to this. In Exodus 14, let's go on down. Exodus 14, verse number 1. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speaking to the children of Israel that they... Uh, Hang on here. I'm, uh, and the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel that they turn and encamp before Piharoth, uh, between Migdal and the sea, over against Belzephon. Before it ye shall encamp by the sea. Now, Piharoth means mouth of hole or canyon. And when we look at this, when you zoom in, look at this canyon. There's only one way in to where they cross the Red Sea and camp by the sea here. And here's the canyon. So when we read here in a minute that the Egyptians were closing in and they were scared for their lives, and I always thought, why don't they just run? You know, like if you're in the desert, like just go that way, you know. Well, they can't. I mean, they're landlocked. Because the other word here, Migdal, means fortified city or tower. So where they were at, they were, they were locked in. They were blocked in by the mountains. And, and the only way they had was this Piharoth, this canyon here, was how the, God led them in here. And so that was their only way out that they had. And so the Gulf of Aqaba here is really deep to the north and to the south of this. You can see where they crossed. Uh, when you look here, and, and I can, you can see it from here, there's lots of really deep, dark blue here. And then when you zoom out, there's lots of dark blue here. But Ron Wyatt said that right here at Nueva, there's a natural land bridge. And the water's about 200 feet deep on that natural land bridge. Everything else is like 1,000 some feet deep. And so when they cro uh, Ron Wyatt also said that when they did all this research there in the 80s, that they found, and I wrote this down, that they found human leg bones, chariot wheels, chariot axles, and horse hooves covered and preserved in coral all across here, even almost to the Saudi Arabian side. Uh, and he said that uh, he claims that the chariot wheels and axles match those that would have been used by the Egyptians at the time of Moses. And so he believes that this is really truly where they crossed, and it makes sense that that's where they would have crossed the Red Sea at. Now, here's where I'm going with this for tonight. Uh, I want to go back to this one because I'm going to need it in a second. Uh, here's, what's, here's where I'm going with this tonight. Notice in all this that God let Israel down the, wrong, the long way around, right? Do you notice that? That really if right here is they were, here, they were camped here. I mean, they started here in Ramesses in this area, went to Succoth, and then instead of going right over here to Israel where God was going to give them the land, God sends them through, these, through the desert, through all these mountains, right? And then they come out like over here and cross over here and then uh, into to the, uh, the wilderness here. You know, and right in here is where Mount Sinai is. And so God took them the long way. Instead of going zip, they went over and then eventually worked their way back up there to that land. So you know, God knew what he was doing. I was Todd, you can get rid of that PowerPoint if you want, brother. I'm done with it. Uh, God, nothing takes God by surprise. God took, God took them the long route instead of the short route. But you know, God always has the best plan. God always plans the best way for his people to take. You know, we might not always understand it. We might not always agree with it. But his way is the right way. Psalm 23, we all know the 23rd Psalm. Verse 3 says, He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in paths of righteousness for His name's sake. God always has the right way. The Bible tells us in Exodus 13, 17, why God took them on the longer route. Let's turn there. Go with me back to Exodus chapter 13 and verse number 17. It tells us why God took them on the longer route. And it came to pass when Pharaoh had let the people go that God led them not through the way of the land of the Philistines, although that was near. For God said, lest peradventure the people repent when they see war and they return to Egypt. So 
you know, God, God wanted to harden His people, right? Because, and He wanted to toughen His people in the wilderness because they were going to have some strong fights ahead of them when they were fighting all those people in the land of Canaan, right? The, namely, the Philistines would be one of them. You know, Warren Wearsby in his commentary also suggested that in addition to them having to fight the Philistines too early, and the Philistines would have overtaken them because they weren't used to fighting. They were used to making bricks. They were used to being slaves. They weren't a fighting people. Uh, the Philistines would have overtaken them. But he also said that, that all along that route, uh, that northern route along the Mediterranean, that the Egyptians had military outposts, I guess, to keep the Philistines from coming into Egypt. And so not only that would they would have encountered the Philistines, but they would have encountered all these Egyptian military posts along the way that would have, uh, would have challenged, I guess, the Israelites as they went. You know, ultimately it comes down to God knew what He was doing. Amen? You know, when He was leading the Israelites. And here's the connection that God made with me when I was sitting in the Honda dealership on Monday getting the oil changed. Not only does God know what He was doing when He was working with Him, but He knows what He's doing when He's, when he's working with this church. Right when He's leading our church, we you know, we don't know who the next pastor that God has for our church. We, you know, we we don't know how long we're going to have to wait until God sends the next man to to lead our church. But we do know that ever how long it takes, that God is preparing us for the next stage of the ministry for our church, and He's preparing the right man uh, to lead this church. And so we can trust the path that God has for us, right? You know, we, can, we know that God's timing and God's path will be the right path and it'll be the right timing and it'll be the right man at the right time for our church. And so God, that really hit me like the V8 can in the commercial when I was sitting there in the Honda dealership. You know, I told Tiff when we got in the car, I'm like, you know, and so it just, you know, this is what Warren Wiersbe says. He says, if you permit the Lord to direct your steps, Expect to be led occasionally on paths that seem unnecessarily long or circuitous. Remind yourself that God knows what He's doing. He isn't in a hurry. And as long as you follow Him, you're safe and in the place of His blessing. He may close some doors and suddenly open others, and we must be alert. So let's go back in our Bibles to Exodus chapter number 13. And let's look at verse number 21. Exodus 13, 21. I'm sorry, I know you're all probably thinking, dude, make up your mind, right? I mean, we're here, there, like Tigger in the Bible. But uh... <laughs> All right, so notice here in, in Exodus 13, 21, that it says that, that He was before them, and it says at the latter on the verse, to lead them. The children of Israel were doing just fine when they had their eyes on the Lord. But I want you to flip over with me to chapter number 14. And I want you to find verse number 10. Go with me to chapter 14 and look at verse number 10. And it says in verse number 10, And when Pharaoh drew nigh, the children of Israel lifted up their eyes, and behold, the Egyptians marched after them. And look, look at what it says. And they were sore afraid. And the children of Israel cried out unto the Lord. And they said unto Moses, Because there were no graves in Egypt, hast thou taken us away to die in the wilderness? Wherefore hast thou dealt with us to carry us forth out of Egypt? Is not this the word that we did tell thee in Egypt, saying, Let us alone, that we may serve the Egyptians? For it had been better for us to serve the Egyptians than that we should die in the wilderness. You know, back in... In Exodus 13, 21, they were just fine when they kept their eyes on the pillar and they were following it. And that was because they were walking by faith. But once they took their eyes off of the Lord and they looked back and they saw the Egyptians, they became afraid and they began to complain and they began to murmur. Remember on one of the last maps we looked at that they were closed in. When we looked at Nueva there, they were closed in. There was nowhere for them to go. In their minds, it, it was death, right? That Egyptian army was going to take them over. And the Bible tells us that he, I mean, he pretty much sent like his, his, like his special forces guys. It was his best chariot forces that he sent. It was the, I guess, the Navy SEALs of the Egyptian world. You know, that, that they knew that it, was, it meant death for them. And, uh, you, know, you know, that's when God tends to show up, right? When we're at the end of our cells... That's when God shows up. But you know, unbelief tends to cause us to forget God's Word. 
And it, it tends to cause us to forget all the times that God has answered our prayers. It tends to make us to forget all the times that we've seen God move in our life. That we, we have those moments where we could sense His presence. That unbelief, that uh, fear can cause us to have those moments. You know, fear can do one of two things. It can either paralyze us or it can cause us to react. Right? It can cause us to make a quick decision. It can cause us to make a quick move that is not in God's will. You know, people get saved and the world tries to lure them back in. And notice what Moses says to the Israelites here in their moment of fear. Look with me in Exodus chapter 14, we're in verse number 13. And Moses said unto the people, Fear ye not, stand still and see the salvation of the Lord, which He will show to you today. For the Egyptians whom you have seen today, you shall see them again no more forever. The Lord shall fight for you, and ye shall hold your peace. <laughs> right? Shut up and be still and watch what God's about to do, right? You know, that reminds me of Psalm 46.10. It says, be still and know that I am God. We see in verse 15 that God tells them to go, and He told Moses what to do. The fact that they were trapped at the sea with canyons and the Egyptian army closing in wasn't an issue for God, right? So let's read together here. I'm going to pick up, we're going to read starting in verse, we're in chapter 14, we're in verse 16. I'm just going to read down to the end of the narrative. But lift thou up thy rod and stretch out thine hand over the sea and divide it. And the children of Israel shall go on dry land through the mist of the sea. And I will, and, and I behold, I will harden the hearts of the Egyptians, and they shall follow them, and I will get me honor upon Pharaoh, and upon all his host, upon his chariots, and upon his horsemen. And the Egyptians shall know that I am the Lord, when I have gotten me honor upon Pharaoh, upon his chariots, and upon his horsemen. Now look at this in verse 19. And the angel of God which went before the camp of Israel, removed and went behind them. And the pillar of the cloud went from before their face and stood behind them. And it came between the camp of the Egyptians and the camp of Israel. And it was a cloud and darkness to them, but it gave light by night to these, so that the one came not near the other all night. And Moses stretched out his hand over the sea, and the Lord caused the sea to go back by a strong east wind all that night, and made the sea dry land, and the waters were divided. And the children of Israel went into the midst of the sea upon the dry ground, and the waters were a wall unto them on their right hand and on their left. And the Egyptians, and the Egyptians pursued and went in after them to the midst of the sea, even all Pharaoh's horses, his chariots and his horsemen. And it came to pass that in the morning... Watch, the Lord looked into the host of the Egyptians through the pillar of fire and of the cloud and troubled the host of the Egyptians and took off their chariot wheels that they drave them heavily so that the Egyptians said, Let us flee from the face of Israel, for the Lord fighteth for them against the Egyptians. And the Lord said unto Moses, Stretch out thy hand over the sea that the waters may come again upon the Egyptians, upon their chariots and upon their horsemen. And Moses stretched forth his hand over the sea, and the sea returned to the, his strength when the morning appeared. And the Egyptians fled against it, and the Lord overthrew the Egyptians in the midst of the sea. And the waters returned and covered the chariots and the horsemen and all the host of Pharaoh that came into the sea after them. There remained not so much as one of them. Now, Dr. Harold Wilmington in his Bible, in his uh, uh commentary in the Bible suggests that the Red Sea parted as much as one mile wide. And again, that, I mean, when you think about it, it makes sense for two million people plus their livestock to cross. You know, again, I go back to the, the Ten Commandments, Charlton Heston, right, when it opens, you know, like a little hallway opens up, you know. Uh, but, but, you know, the Bible tells us that, you know, that in Exodus 14, 21, that it was a strong east wind all that night. You know, it didn't take God all night to roll the waters back. The wind blew all night because it probably took that long for all of them to cross uh, across the Red Sea there. Verse 20 tells us that they crossed it. Uh, they, they crossed all night. It says all the night. Verse 27 says when the morning appeared. So, you know, and it makes sense that the pillar 
a, a fire, you know, when it, when it went behind them, it created light in front of them and it created darkness behind them so the Egyptians couldn't come through to them, that they, they crossed all night. Dr. Leon Wood, that, that was quoted in Harold, Dr. Harold Wilmington's book, calculated this time and space required to cross the Red Sea. He says, a, a marching line of two million people walking ten abreast with an average of five feet, five feet separating each rank would be approximately 190 miles long. Had this path been the, only as wide as a modern highway, the first Israelites through would have been in Canaan before the last started and several days would have lapsed. So, I mean, think, that, so when God parted the, the seas, it was at least a mile wide that he parted them for them to be able to get that many people to get through in, in, in the course of the night. That, I didn't realize that, you know. I mean, it's just those reminders of what an awesome God that we serve, right? Uh, you know, just like the children of Israel had to go under the Red Sea for God to save them from Egypt, today we have to go under the blood of the Lamb to be saved. Tonight, if you've never asked Jesus to save you and forgive you your sins, you're like the Israelites that are trapped between the Red Sea and the mountains with the Egyptian army closing in. You have no hope. But praise God, He made a way for us through His Son. If you'd only ask the Lord Jesus Christ in your heart to save you and forgive you your sins and place your faith and trust in Him, you'll be saved from destruction, just like the Israelites did. If God's spoken to your heart, come down. I'll take a Bible and I'll show you how to be saved tonight. Okay? I hope it was interesting tonight. I, uh, I enjoy studying for it. And so, uh, and hope that helps as we and create some excitement as we get to speak to these little ones of, and share the gospel with them and share the excitement. Your excitement is contagious. And so when you're excited about what you're teaching and you're excited about the opportunity to have visitors in our building, uh, we have 14 signed up. So we had four just a few days ago. We have 14 as of this afternoon. And so uh, it's, it's exciting. We've got three in Kim's, four in Kim's class three in Elaine's class and seven in Sue's class. So, uh, and those mail, things did hit the mailbox. Sorry for the confusion. We got a weird email from the company. Are we still doing our thing? Can, okay. Can you? Uh, we got a weird email from the company. We thought that they weren't going to send it out. So that's why I, I had tips in that text to the lady saying, would you please put on social media? And then right after that, Jenna goes, oh, we got one in our mailbox today.